Welcome to this short video where we're going to look at sound waves from two different perspectives. We'll look at them as displacements of layers pushing on each other and as oscillations in pressure. In equilibrium, we can look at the medium as being made up of parallel layers with the same separation between adjacent layers everywhere. Now, when a sound wave passes through the medium, the layers oscillate longitudinally, that is, in the same direction as the wave is traveling. Let's look at this more closely. We'll define, first of all, an x-axis in the direction in which the wave is traveling. Now, any particular layer has been displaced from its equilibrium position. If it was originally at a position x, now it has been displaced a distance y, let's say. And the displacement of each layer, uh, y, oscillates as a wave in the direction of x. Let's look at what happens now to an adjacent pair of layers as a consequence of this. In equilibrium, they're separated by a distance delta x. And let's agree for argument's sake that we're looking at a column of cross-sectional area A. So between them, the two layers enclose a volume V, which is equal to the cross-sectional area times the separation delta x. Now the wave passes through, and the layer on the left is displaced by a distance y. And the layer on the right is displaced by a different distance, y plus a delta y. So the volume between the two layers also changes to v plus a delta v. The change in volume delta v is of course equal to the product of the area A and the difference in displacement delta y. And since the displacement in y, in y in general, is a function of the coordinate x, we can write this last term as the partial derivative of y with respect to x, multiplied then by the separation delta x. Finally, we recognize that A times delta x is none other than the volume V between the two layers. So the change in volume delta V is simply proportional to the equilibrium volume V by a proportionality factor, which is dy dx. Here's where the pressure comes in. If the volume between two layers expands, the pressure drops, and vice versa. And this leads us to define a useful parameter, which is the bulk modulus. It's defined as the ratio between the change in pressure and the fractional change in volume. And we put a minus sign in front, too, to make B always positive. But we have already met the relative change in volume. It's the derivative of y with respect to x. So from the definition of the bulk modulus, we can write the pressure fluctuation as minus b times dy dx. Now let's calculate this derivative, dy dx. We know that the displacement y has the form of a wave. So it's straightforward to calculate the derivative. And we find that the pressure fluctuation also has the form of a wave. It's a bunch of constants multiplying a sine of omega t minus kx. Let's look more closely at this wave. All the constants multiplying the sine function represent, of course, the amplitude of the wave. So we have a nice relation between the amplitude of the displacement wave and the amplitude of the pressure wave. Now before we go any further, I'd like to say a word about the bulk modulus in practice. Uh, this is a quantity that depends, of course, on the medium. And normally, for calculations, we would look it up in a table. But if our medium is an ideal gas, like air, it turns out to have a particularly simple form, which is actually independent of the composition of a particular gas. Uh, let's start from the ideal gas law. Now here, n and r are constants, the number of moles in our sample of gas and the universal gas constant. So what this is telling us is the product of pressure and volume is proportional to the temperature. If the temperature remains constant as the wave passes through the gas, a condition that is known as isothermal, then the fluctuation in the product of P and V breaks up into two terms, V times delta P and P times delta V. 
And this is equal to zero if delta t is zero, which is the definition of an isothermal wave. Now, this equation, if you look at it closely, it's actually merely the definition of the bulk modulus in a different form. In fact, if you go back and look up the definition of B again, we'll see that B is simply equal to the gas pressure P. A more likely scenario, though, is that the wave propagates adiabatically. And this means that no heat is transferred between different layers as the wave travels through. In fact, this is a far more likely scenario, as the wave would have to travel very slowly to equalize the temperature at all times. We won't go into the gory details, but let me just say that B is now the pressure multiplied by a certain factor, gamma, called a specific heat ratio, which depends on the kind of molecules that make up the gas, and it's equal to 1.4 in the case of air. All right, let's do a little calculation, which I think will actually surprise you. The faintest sound that we can hear has a pressure amplitude of about 20 micropascals. So let's say that we're hearing a sound of frequency 1 kilohertz, and that we are in normal atmospheric conditions with a pressure of 100 kilopascals and with a sound speed of about uh, 340 meters per second. We will also assume that the sound wave propagates adiabatically. The question is, what is the displacement amplitude of this wave? Okay, so as usual at this point, I would invite you to pause the video, do the calculation, and when you resume the video, we will look at the answer. This is a straightforward application of the relation we found between the pressure amplitude and the displacement amplitude. When we substitute the data given in the problem, we find that the maximum displacement of a layer in the air is only of the order of 10 to the minus 12 meters, which is roughly the size of an atom. It's quite amazing that our hearing is so sensitive that we can perceive displacements of air of this size.